All right, uh, my name is Jim Pavlik. This is our panel on why this industry sucks and what we can do to it. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Um, I've been doing freelance illustration full time for about 15 years, uh, and that's pretty much been my only job, you know, except for the stupid jobs you work before you can afford to do this. And that's my intro. <laughs> I'm Todd Lockwood. I've uh, been working in this industry since about 1994. Uh, started at TSR in 96. But apart from the six years at TSR and Wizards of the Coast, I've freelanced my 30 plus years of, of professional illustration. Uh, I did advertising, uh, came to loathe it, found my way into this career that I always wanted to work in, which I really love. Uh, and now I'm freelancing. And yeah, it can be a tough row sometimes. Aaron? I'm Aaron Miller. I'm the new guy. The FNG. <laughs> this is my third year, but I've got a, over do, uh, 10 years of design experience in art direction. So um, I've got a lot of freelance background. But Can you all hear him? He's off. No. He's speak up, man. See, that's why you should be up here in Belden. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading lips anyway. <laughs> Randy, go ahead. Uh, I'm Randy Gallegos, and uh, minus the many years in advertising that Tom had, amazingly, I started about the same time he did in 94, in this mm. industry anyway, with significantly less to show for it, I might add. But, um, <laughs> but I've been doing it freelance pretty much the whole time and have uh, stomached years of crushing poverty and uh, just fighting an industry that continues to um, have new opportunities open up at the same time old ones close and uh, rates not necessarily change very much and expectations climb ever higher with competition and lots and lots of people entering in wanting to be a part of it. Um, I'm Mike Sass. I, uh, I was the first artist hired at Bioware in 1995 and I worked there as the marketing artist for 12 years. Um, and as I was at Bioware I was doing a lot of fantasy art, um, talking to Todd Lockwood. He would help me as a mentor a little bit from time to time. Um, and I always wanted to be a freelancer. I thought that was, um, I mean, that's where you're the pure artist. You can do art every day. There's no <laughs> political stuff and meetings. And, and Todd would tell me, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. It's rough. And uh, I left Bioware in 2008 and found that out for myself in the last three years. <laughs> so I think we're going to start off giving you a little bit of anecdotal evidence from each of our point of views of how things are going in this industry. And I think my story would be probably about 10 years ago, I helped organize a boycott uh, of a company because I felt they were paying too low. And I got enough artists to say, no, we won't work for you anymore unless you pay us more. So the owner called me up and he said, what's the problem? And I told him, you know, we just want a little more money. And he agreed to it. So our pay went up to $200 per card. And now, 10 years later, a lot of you are working for that company for $175 a card. So things are going backwards almost across the board. There's no cost of living increases going on anywhere. And like I said, if anything, people are pulling back. And there's really no need. The market hasn't shrunk. It's pretty much the same market. If not, it's expanded. So there's really no reason that we shouldn't be able to make a little more for what we're putting out there. But there are challenges now because a lot of these companies will find artists in Russia or Southeast Asia, China is even starting to open up, and they'll take 175 bucks for a card and feel like they've, they've had a windfall. Um, so I don't see it improving, really. So we have to find ways to, as a community, do better. I'm not we're, and we're not going to suggest that we should create an artist union because it's not going to happen. It doesn't work. There's always new students who will take that hundred dollar card, and that, that just drives things down. But that it's a very real problem. Um, book commissions haven't gone up in 20 years. Yeah. Um, we were going to talk about anecdotes about just the reality of some of the things. So when we talk about the solutions, people can understand the numbers behind it and, and the reasons why we're talking about this. So, Todd, do you want to maybe expand upon that a little bit? Well, I thought I just did. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, any thoughts, Aaron? Uh, uh, I, like, I'm, since I'm new, I, everything is looking back at what I did before. Hey, why don't you compare 
what's going on for you now as opposed to what was going on for you in graphic design? Oh, I had a lot less talent in graphic design, but a lot more zeros taking it home. And then as soon as I got here into the illustration industry, the I had a lot more talent to build up, and I feel like I'm as I'm building it up, I'm still those zeros are a lot further away. It was a lot easier to make money with no talent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, a lot of people enter this industry because it's it's a lot of fun. It's the industry, it's the imagery they want to make, and if there's some way in which they can earn a, a living doing it, uh, you'll fight really hard to do it. And I know it's because of what I've done. Um, and so just before this, I kind of wrote out a little example of what kind of a living you're not likely to make. Um, you can make a living, and there are people who certainly do. And if you get to a pretty high level, you can make a pretty good one. Uh, for the bulk of people, though, uh, I just kind of scribbled out here because, you know, you don't want to talk about, you know, what clients pay in particular. Um, but if you were an artist in this industry who could, you know, put out, you know, 15 magic cards a year, you did 10 for World of Warcraft, which pays pretty decent as card scale goes, you did four covers for a decent RPG cover, and a good 15, 16 spot illustrations in color uh, for a year. If you can, if you had that body of work in a year, you're at about thirty-five thousand dollars a year, gross. And I don't know how many of you have that kind of work in a given year, but that's what you're looking at. And so, if you want to be able to make a living in this industry, it is extremely hard. And the fact that we and I, I spent years as well, you know, taking on projects that paid extraordinarily small amounts of money because it's work mm -hmm. and you know it's really easy to essentially get minimum wage or less because you're working really hard to put out a good product uh, for very small pay and there's a sense in which I don't want anyone here to think that I don't want you to make those decisions because you're hurting me um, I mean you are but more <laughs> importantly more importantly you're hurting yourself down the line because the choices that I made 15 years ago in taking some of those have resulted in an industry that today has not grown rates has you know greater expectations for the smaller amount of pay that they're paying and so I'm actually hurting myself over time and so the decisions that you're going to make as you um, take on jobs and take on low paying jobs because they you know you just want something printed you know to have in your portfolio which isn't as important as you might think um, they're going to come back and they're going to hurt you down the line and so a lot of what we're talking about is trying to encourage uh, try to encourage ways for you to think about how you can uh, make different choices in this industry because it's not up to us to tell the industry how to do its job they they need to do their job they they need to make money obviously and uh, they'll make the choices they make based on what we're willing to do for them, really, ultimately. And, um, and you can't fault them for that. And most companies have two levels of, of, uh, of employees. They're your direct, you know, your art directors and the people that are working closest to you, most of them support what you do and would like to see you and often do go to bat for artists. Level above that, far removed from the artist, you know, they're much more just, you know, focused on the bean counting. And they're not like they're going to resist those moves, especially when they know we're making decisions for other companies uh, and accepting far less uh, for similar kind of work. So, when Randy's talking about how you're hurting yourself down the road, um, a lot of these companies, it's becoming more and more the norm, the norm that you're going to get a work for hire contract, which means the buyer owns all rights. You can't sell print, you can't put it in an art book, you can't collateralize it in any way. And that's really stealing from your future income, if, if you agree to that. Uh, some companies who, who want to protect their IP, like Wizards of the Coast, will let you do prints and uh, use it in uh, retrospectives like an art book or sometimes a calendar. But even Wizards of the Coast wants to restrict what percentage. And I understand that they're not unreasonable in their, in their expectation, but they don't want you to fill up an art book with all Wizards of the Coast-owned properties. Um, because they could do that if, if they wanted to, um, although they'd get a fight from me because <laughs> and have in the past. John, think, John knows. But what happens down the road when you've built a little bit of a reputation and you're making some of your sales on things like print sales and you sell the, a, a cover that you own the copyright to to a publication overseas, your work is starting to pay you back for the, for for your having protected it for all that time. Um, 
I had a, a great Gen Con this last year where I sold about $12,000 worth of prints. It was almost all prints. And I couldn't have done that if I had signed all those rights away forever, every time I did an illustration for somebody. So you have to protect your future now. And if you sign a work-for-hire contract for 100 bucks, you've really hurt yourself. And what we're seeing now is, you know, as companies come and go, smaller companies come in and they look, they don't really know about the art side of things. They know they design the game, but they don't know about the art. So they look to companies like Watsi or whoever, they're like, well, what kind of contracts do they use? And they see it's work for hire. So they think it's industry standard to offer everybody a work for hire contract. So what we need to do as artists with some of these smaller companies or mid-sized companies, new companies, when they offer you work for hire contracts, have some contracts of your own and say, well, I'm not really comfortable working for that. Here's what I am comfortable working for. And make sure, you know, like Todd says, you negotiate the ability to make prints, you know, the ability to use it in an art book. And I was talking to a professional photographer who's been doing this for over 30 years, and he says a third of his income every year comes from the resale of images. If you sign all that away 10 years, 20 years down the road, you're not going to have that third of your income, and you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So we need to just kind of fight back against all the work for hire out there. And, you know, it, it's not going to work against licensed properties, of course, you know, Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. You're not going to be able to m win that battle. But if some company contacts you, I need a wizard casting a fireball spell. That's generic. They don't need the rights to that forever and ever and ever. But that's this image that you could resell down the road. Well, there's times when they will. I mean, if they provide you with concept art, then it's IP, it's intellectual property. Yeah, and and they're not out of bounds to expect that they own the character or the, the, the image. But if they're going to come to you and say, we want to own this forever and ever and ever, then you have to say, well, then $200 is, is not, not enough. enough. Yeah. Now, there's going to be times, obviously, when you've got a bill to pay and that's the only offer you've had and, and there's really nothing else you can do. You know, we can't fault you for that. But just be aware that... Um, that's a that's a really deep rut that you can find yourself in if if you always say yes. The most powerful word in your contracting vocabulary is no. And you read the contracts too. Read the contract. Be willing to walk away from a job. Is at least if you have the ability, like we've been discussing, to do prints, even though you don't own the rights, you can do prints. But there are contracts out there that will say you have to pay that company if you do prints. You have to pay that company if you want to put it in your portfolio to show it on the internet on your portfolio. You have to pay them a percentage every year from the work that you get from that image of having appeared or whatever. So those are the easiest no's in the world to mm -hmm. say, just, nope, sorry. And, or there's no reason to let that. John. So. I get to see it from both sides of the fence, you know, being with listeners to the ghost. Sure. So the, the thing I want to throw out there is the fact that one of the challenges I have, I mean, I have the discussion on a yearly basis when we get ready to do budgets. I sit here and say, hey, we have an increased rates for X amount of years, 15 years at this point. And say, we need to increase rates. I mean, hell, minimum wage has gone up 12 times in the last 15 years. Why haven't we increased our rates? And the response I constantly get, because you're dealing with bean counters, you're not dealing with, you know, people who understand art or the living of art is, okay, explain to me the last time you were able to produce a book, or you weren't able to produce a book because every artist told you no when you offered them a contract. And that's the challenge I have. Mm -hmm. you know, on my side, I want to increase rates. But it's really hard for me to go to my bosses and say, look, I've got an entire tier of artists that say no to me. Yeah, you can always wave me at them if it'll help. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but the problem is Problems aren't you, Todd. I know, I'm one guy. You're one guy. It's the 40 other people I call up, and every single one of them says, Yes. Mm -hmm. In a heartbeat, I will do that. I know, now, that's the, the that is challenge. Is, that's the challenge we have in the industry. So, there you go, an example of you know, our decisions kind of hurting ourselves, right? Because here's someone saying that you know, there's a way it, he could put evidence forward you know, why, as to why things could change, and there's enough people that will say yes, and I've I've been one of those over the years, yeah. you know. I was too in the beginning. Yeah. What yeah. can you do? I mean, it, it, it's part of being dedicated enough to stick it out. You know, a lot of the people who are saying yes will have 
hurt themselves, then they'll they'll find another job. But if 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 you really want to stick it out, you have to be willing to up your game and be aware of those contract situations and always be trying to better your 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 situation um, in the industry. One of my anecdotes uh, sort of speaks to that. I went to uh, Gen Con in, in 2001, uh, whenever Winter Nights was being made, and uh, this was the first time I, I came and met real artists. You know, I didn't live in a place where there was other artists, and I met Todd Lockwood and Donato and Lars and all these guys, and did a couple really crappy freelance jobs for Wizards of the Coast at that time that still haunt me today because I really wasn't ready at that time. Yeah. Um, went and worked for another 10 years at my job. Then came to IlixCon um, in 2009, and it was the same guys. So in that 10-year period, it didn't seem like the field had, it didn't seem like the crop of artists had changed a lot. Like, I walked in the door and it was like, whoa, hey, you know, hey, everybody knew everybody on a first-name basis. Even though I hadn't seen them for 10 years, they know me, I knew them, and it didn't seem like the crop of pros had really grown. So what Todd is saying about, um, you know, protecting your career and thinking long term and, and, and these sort of steps, the people that haven't done that, it seems like you may get a foothold in the industry for a year or two, but I get the sense that there's sort of a, the guys that do this work and have, you know, low, low uh, expenses and whatnot and, and take the steps to be sustainable, they can go year after year, but there's always, you know, the young guys come in and go out and come in and go out. And, and, and feed off of the lower rates, but it's not a sustainable situation. And it was just an interesting anecdote for me to, to, it was a shock to see that it was the exact same guys doing the same work for the same companies 10 years later, and that the field hadn't really grown or expanded. So it, it shows that the, the bar of entry is, is really high to, first of all, get in, but stay in, and be cagey enough to do these things to stay in. There are a lot of guys who have day jobs, Lars Grant West, as he was building his portfolio and his skills, he worked for a zoo as a graphic designer. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Mark Zug worked in a foundry or something. Um, so those guys were painting evenings and weekends to, to get their foothold. And to allow themselves some freedom to say no. And to allow themselves because a they Because they're not no. dependent on $100 illustrations That's to pay their exactly bills. Right. That's exactly right. So uh, uh, I'm about a year into illustration. And one question I'm wondering by hearing you guys talk is, even though the, the pay rates were low, didn't you benefit from working on Dungeons and Dragons and the name recognition of things like, you know, Warhammer and those big, like Star Wars, you know, I mean, sure, you can't use your Star Wars painting, but you can still show it and look, you know, I right. painted Queen Amidala or, absolutely you know, all, all that. So but I how, had a, a day job you, at the beginning, too. I was doing advertising illustration, but that was my day job. So then what? what's your... Advice because I mean I really want to work on Dungeons and Dragons. I mean that's something I've always wanted. Um, how do you balance that with the fact that the pay rates aren't great? Like I feel like you guys are saying we should say no, but you're at a point where you've benefited from the yes in the past already. That's yeah, I'm actually gonna I'm gonna dispute that a little bit. I've actually hurt myself a lot from taking those some of those very jobs um, because when you're getting paid a very low rate and you took it because you're totally thrilled to work on a product and that amount of pay, you're going to stretch it as far as you can because you want to make a good piece, but you're going to drive yourself to, you are going to be homeless if you spent all the time you needed to on that quarter page illustration, right? So you're either going to become homeless because you took a month to do that quarter page or you're going to cut your corners and you're going to cut your corners in a way to make an acceptable illustration, but not one that's going to actually help you in the end. <laughs> So, you know, you'll, you'll produce a piece which is marginal. It's okay. I almost shouldn't say this, but go by my table in the art show. There's some really old originals of mine there that are from and, when I was first trying to get in here. Some cards I did for Wizards of the Coast. Where I, I had to do two a day in order to make it pay out. And they're, it shows. They're kind of crappy. And they actually do hurt you. And art directors do do see it. Oh, it hurts when I look at them right now. I look over. <laughs> why, why did I bring that stuff here instead of the bigger painters? Right. And yeah. I'll expand upon that, too. I said I got work immediately in 2001. And, like, literally half an hour ago, a guy came up with a D&D &D book published, like, last year. 
And he said, oh, you're in this. And I'm like, really? I really haven't done much. And I looked, and it's like the worst pitcher I did like 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> so the point is, is, so I went back and worked for another 10 years, you know, built up, you know, my savings, got into a better situation, got my skills and portfolio to a place where then um, I could attempt to get the higher level jobs. And I guess my point would be is don't be in a real rush, you know, like, if you're in a good situation where you can learn in the evenings, maybe you don't have kids yet, you have a job that allows you to, um, you know, maybe take some, some time off, take some workshops, um, that's powerful. It gets harder to learn, harder to, um, you know, say no when, when your income is your freelance income and that's it. So even, even just like waiting is, is sometimes a really good thing to do. If I might add, uh, Ms. Sam. Yeah. You got to pick and choose. You know, if if somebody's offering you a Star Wars piece and you really want to work on Star Wars and the pay is kind of crappy, but you're going to make that Star Wars piece a portfolio piece, and the odds are that you're going to be able to sell that original, that makes that gamble a little bit safer than of the many offers that you're going to get where. You're probably not going to sell that painting or, or prints of it or anything. So, you know, we're not saying say no across the board. That's unrealistic for us to say that, and especially like you point out, because we have all done it. So we're not saying say no across the board. We're saying pick and choose, and where you can negotiate for yourself a better situation. And you can do that by limiting the number you take. Maybe you just take one. And think about how many times you can get paid for one image. Like, my top selling print is something I did over 10 years ago. Um, I did a, a, an image like maybe eight years ago, and suddenly that character's big again in a new video game, and boom, that print is selling like hotcakes, and it's like, cool. So, so yeah, pursue the stuff that you can leverage, you know, originals, licenses, you know, things that have multiple streams of income over a long period of time. But to that same thing for a hundred bucks, at, at this point, I mean, I already knew it because I came from an industry that a hundred bucks is answering the phone. That's, 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 you know, you're already there. We're already at a hundred bucks because we're talking. So at a hundred bucks, it's like how many days? Mm -hmm. And then at that point, what could I have just done for myself? Exactly, and given at the time it needed. Well, then I own it. If you really you want own. to do Star Wars that bad, Let's do your own piece. Oh, my question was: you're talking about waiting and improving your portfolio until you feel you can get into the freelance world, and you pay for your quality work. Where would you suggest working while you're waiting to improve your portfolio? I mean, like, you talked about being in advertising or doing graphic design for zoos, like, but yeah. I mean. Mark Zug worked in a foundry. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, you do what you have to do. To There's guys goals, in obviously. the main show, uh, the two Croatian guys. <laughs> I bet nobody knew these guys two years ago. Boom, main show. Like, if you got the chops, you get entry into these, you know, palaces and gates and shows easily. Like, if you can do it, you can do it. You're there. And this like, is, yeah, this is a little of the myth I was talking about about the the desire to the need to be published. Because if your work is excellent, you can walk in the door having not been published. You'll have to get over a little bit of the are you reliable bit. But if you come off as professional, you come off as professional. And that can be easily allayed. But if, you're, if, if your work is awesome, you're going to go straight to the top anyway. And you'll skip all those entry-level jobs. So you don't need to necessarily have been you know, published in a lot of small places. You know. I was well into my 30s when I got the breaks that led me to the career I have now. And before that, I was honing my craft and learning my contract skills and all that stuff in advertising, doing work I really hated, but it was paying my bills. But on the side, I was also doing things for myself and building a, a portfolio that eventually I showed at my first convention, and, and then the doors started to open. So you can't really expect to just get out of art school and kick a door down and, and start making money. Um, you mentioned... You know, if you really want to do a Star Wars piece, but, you know, you want to do it for yourself, what would the legality be regarding selling prints and, you know, selling the original piece? You're not supposed to, yeah. Well, you're not supposed to, but go to yeah. a Comic-Con and see everybody up and down the aisle selling Marvel characters mm -hmm. and Star Wars. 
they're not at the convention policing yeah. what because, you're doing. I mean, I've seen I'm not going to advocate. All the time, but I mean, I know they're. We just don't do it online. The legal yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't make a book. Don't do. Because yeah. a teacher of mine, he did a portrait of John Lennon, and he put it up on eBay, and he was actually, you know, slapped on. Right, but it's where did where did he get his reference? Yeah. That's a, from a photos. If you're getting your own references, building your own character. Yeah, take your own picture of John Lennon. <laughs> 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 what was your point, Mike? shouldn't be wanting to do Star Wars material yes. because you're going to Comic-Con and see Everyone's more doing than it. you can possibly look at. If every Tom, Dick, and Harry and the art shows showing pictures do something that's different. Yeah, right. yeah that's yeah. why yeah. I've had no interest in Star Wars. Wars. You want people to remember you when they walk out at art show. They're not going to remember you if you're doing yet another Yoda or Han Solo. You know, And and this is apart from all the the commission Star Wars work that Lucas had done for the movies already, which is already at the highest quality. So why would you, I don't understand why you would want to do that and take the chance of just being another face of this huge crowd instead of trying to come up with something original that will make an name for yourself. Yeah, that would have been my point. I agree. Some of the great stars in the industry now with stuff like Kickstarter coming up, wouldn't it be out of the question to do some of your own intellectual properties? And, and you we're, great we're getting so to that. Not, <laughs> next, next way. <laughs> we we're 25 minutes in. So. Yeah. That's it? You're That's exactly it. right. And a lot of people are, are doing that. We are people getting are going to go to your art. They've been following you for years and years. You want to see what your next big thing is going to be. And if it's not a magic card or whatever, it, I mean, it could be a whole a book. Yeah, book right. or, yeah, we need to move on to uh, the idea that an idea that we're having. Some of the ideas, yeah. To to help out, other than just say. So say should no. we go to Kickstarter? Well, yeah, let's go to the website. So so what we okay. have in mind is a website for freelancers to come on. It would be you know a resource. We would explain how different you know the rights. And the terminology of contract terminology. And this would be available there, and you. This can is uh, one this up. is something that Randy wrote, which is fantastic. It goes and it's called uh, learning how to commission illustration. This is something that you would talk to companies about. It's a tool he, he wrote they, they to help companies who aren't really new to this understand small clients in particular, because yeah, there's a lot of self-publishing going on, and these guys have no clue what they're after, and a lot of them I found are teachable. Yeah. Sometimes you have to get over a couple of, you know, they really don't get it. But, you know, if you're patient with them, I found I've actually had very successful interactions with a number of them. And so I put this together and it's, it's long and, you know, nobody likes to read, but I found that people have and it's actually worked, you know, so I'm giving it out and use it, you know. Yeah, so we have copies up here that you can take and if you want to, con there's a PDF we have, you can contact us. It's on Art Order right now. Art Order is carrying yeah. it, yeah. You have that's my website as well. We were talking about a website that would be a resource for illustrators to find out which clients are reliable, what kind of rights they expect. Um, so it would basically be a rating system. So Like you, Angie's List. Right. You would join the website, and if you could, there'd be two kinds of memberships. One where you could just join just to see what companies are rated at what, and there's another level where you would join where you would be able to actually contribute to the vote, the voting of what their level is. But at that level, you have to prove that you've worked for that company. And, you know, so we make sure that guys aren't just coming in to slam somebody because right. they had a bad experience or... No, we're, we're really very early on in discussing yeah, how it would work. We're just kind of brainstorming this, but the, so we're yeah, very open so to ideas. Open but to any suggestions, but we, rating, we, talk, we talked about... Oh, sorry, go ahead. The, the rating would be based on pay, what rights they want, the timeliness of pay, and how easy are they to work with. In other words, is it you send in your sketch and they're like, paint it, and you paint it, and they're like, great, or is it ten revisions? You know, so all those factors would be in and they would come up with some kind of total score. You know, like a Rotten Tomatoes number, like a 78%. Yeah, what we were talking about with memberships, uh, <laughs> something like a membership where you can just come in and look at everything and then a voting membership and we wouldn't post a rating for a company until they've had at least like five reviews or yeah, something we wouldn't just have one review and it's 10 percent and then that yeah because somebody like could shit. come in and flame <laughs> a company for for one late payment or something i mean we, we don't want to be unfair yeah there would definitely be oversight you know we're not just going to let everything go up there and 
and, and the the membership list would be viewable, so you would know. Yeah, so your your voting would be anonymous, so that nobody n knew what percentage you gave a company. But there would be a list, so you could see all of the artists that are participating in this website. You know, so if you come in as a new guy, you see all these names, and you're like, oh, you know, these these guys are saying which companies are good and which aren't. So maybe I should listen. So, so it doesn't look like random or rants or, or scores from inexperienced people who maybe um, a bad result is, is based on maybe their own problem or, or their own failings. So, you know, people that have expectations and, and experience, you know, will be rating it fairly. So that's it's not also it's not also intended to be a forum for complaining and ranting right. and gossiping. Yeah, there, and it, there I, won't there probably won't be any. Yeah, we, we at discussed all. that and decided there I think shouldn't it, be a you know, forum because it would just I, turn I, into I thought a of it session. more in a much more objective basis. You know, something like a credit score. You yeah. know, mm -hmm. where just because you know, it's almost like a better business bureau for <laughs> our industry. <laughs> I'm curious, John, just off the cuff, we, we're making you guys how sweat. you from the other side would would react to that. <laughs> so. Me on the other side, that'd be really easy. I'd love to see that because for me, that gives me something to look at and judge myself and, and, and basically give us you know, a scorecard for where Wizards stands and things and what we need to do or improve or how I can use. Because again, that gives me that, the thing I'm always looking for is concrete stuff I can use to take to my management and say, this is what's working, this is, a, this is what's not working, this is what the impressions are from me. Because you know, right now, all they ever get is anecdotal evidence through me. Okay. And I say, hey, this is a problem. And they go, really? We don't see that, you know. So this that's nice a, to hear. It would right. be actually good for me to have this. You know, it'd be like the movie score. His sister says, "Here's what the critics are saying." Awesome. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad John said that because we're talking about it as a guidance tool too. So instead of just five stars or a score, we'll have criteria like top five star company does these good things. And so when a new client comes in. And, and wants to raise their score or wants to see why, you know. S assuming they give a shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but if they, but don't, they can see well, what's no. important to the artist and why the artist, you know, if, if the top company allows print rights and the top company is, is quick on payment and stuff, then these companies will see, geez, you know, we're not really doing that, you know, maybe that's important. So just calling it out, if, if 100 people are saying that's important, and we don't like when you do this, and not just like one or two emails that the art director yeah. might get. Then we're we're showing a standard, and, and you know, it's been called out. There's a lot of companies I can hear saying because I've heard it more than a few times. Because artists we're all, are a dime a We're dozen. already doing this though, but uh -huh. we do this. This whole system is already happening from artist to artist. Yeah, we do it between each other, but we need a place publicly where you can all see it, but also these companies can see it. You know, they can see that we think they're at twenty percent. And you know they probably, maybe they, like Todd says maybe they won't give a shit. Yeah, but maybe, maybe they'll be like oh, maybe it won't work, but good. but maybe it will be helpful. But it'll work to this. I think it would work to this uh, extent that one companies will become internally competitive. You know, maybe we the hope. companies in the top <laughs> twenty might care that they're number twenty and not eighteen, and so they may want to change some things to get higher on their score. Also, or at the very least, we give the advocates within the company some ammo to use on a personal. It does, it does. It does help because I mean it's like we. As, a, as an industry, look at the rates of other companies and what they're paying. I mean, because to be honest, if I sit here and say, I need to be competitive with X company, and they're now paying $200 more per illustration than I'm doing, well, that what that means is to be able to be competitive, I have to up my rates. Yeah. You know, and so, in that way, if we've got grades coming in, you're saying, this company over here gets five stars and everybody wants to work for him, and they're getting great art, they're getting great products, and I'm going, well, why am I not getting the same level of quality? Well, I have to look at what they're doing. Because it may not always be about dollars. Because like you said, sometimes yeah. it's about rates. Exactly. You know, it's about it's what a lot of times what you don't get. Companies so, could have the same score, but one might pay lower, but give you much more, more rights. rights. Yeah. You know, so, it, and that'll all be broken down in their score. You know, so you can see all of that. And it's a tool for young artists to see, you know, what kind of risk am I taking when I... If I'm going to go, okay, this guy called me, I'll say yes to his job offer. These are the risks I'm, I'm going into bed with. He may not pay on time. A hundred people have said he may pay, not pay on time. Because we or talked earlier all. about ways in which you know, we could get you to say no. If you know that a company, based on their rating, is paying awfully late or never, then when they come to you, you're more likely to say no. Now, because there have been plenty of companies over the years that I worked <laughs> with, I got stiffed on. 
And I, you know, I couldn't shout to the world, avoid these guys. And so a year later, I see they're still working for Illustrator, with illustrators. They're not working with me, but they're working with other guys. And those guys are getting screwed. They could have all said no. And they could have spent that time productively because they spent the time and didn't get paid anyway. So if they've spent three weeks on a project and didn't get paid, they could have done something awesome for themselves and advanced their career. So this is a, a way to help people say no. And it's not just us saying, you should say no. But I mean, this, you'll want to say no because you'll see a company sucks at any of these given metrics and you'll just be like i'm just going to avoid these guys and or, so you, it makes it easier or for it's you. your opportunity to like like you said if you know going in you could you know if the art directors need to hear it more from every artist like hey is there going to be a problem getting paid is can we cut yeah, this can, off can i get half up front can or that up front yeah. and negotiate your score sucks on <laughs> <laughs> on the Pavlik scale. <laughs> There's a question up at the top. Somebody had a question? Go ahead. I'd like to say this is really fantastic. I, I go to uh, the Columbus College of Art and Design, and we don't cover this, like what your guys They won't. About. Try, yeah, they, no they won't. We talk about contracts and stuff, but we have nothing as comprehensive as what you guys are feeling like going into. And about dealing with companies that don't treat you properly or pay you what you deserve. Um, do you have any idea of what this will come up? <laughs> well, <laughs> we talked about that. What we're thinking is that, uh, you know, a website takes a little money to, and time to put together. We're thinking a Kickstarter with a really low entry rate. And, and if you, you bind it at Kickstarter, like, you know, like, I don't know, five, ten bucks yeah. just to get in. And then you'll be, you'll be a member, and that will give us some seed money to get the website created and figure out how it's going to go together. We'll probably want to do it as like a 501c. I don't yeah. know. This is still under discussion because we don't want there to be an appearance that we're profiting from your input. Right. Um, this is more community effort. Yeah. At the same time, you know, it's going to require somebody, not necessarily anyone up here, to, you know, vet, investigate, uh, deal with companies who are complaining, you know, and not sure that they've been rated fairly and why, you know, uh, do we really do pay on time, you know, what evidence yeah. do you have otherwise, you know, so it's going to require someone to be working on it. And so it needs to be something that's financially viable, at least to that level. Right. So the Kickstarter would get it running and then there'd be a very minimal due afterwards to, to become a member. Have you um, thought about, um, instead of um, um, getting involved with creating a website, folding it into an existing organization? We talked yeah, about ASFA and, about and we just thought they're too perfect. dysfunctional and then we're, okay. we're, then we're stuck with the Chesley thing, which is, well, it's fun and it's great for the community and it's been a really valuable thing for a lot of artists' careers. It's also what has kept ASFA, ASFA from being the kind of advocacy group that it originally set out to be. As well, I, I brought up the idea this morning, and you know, a lot of this is really under discussion. Like, if we don't have a business plan or anything. I don't. We don't even know who's involved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, we're, so we're bouncing. Our idea. You know, this was an idea meeting. So. Yeah, this and we want to get your feedback too. Yeah. So if there is time, but we'll to, a, well, to, well, to can I finish addressing uh, Mike's right. point really quick? And one of the things with rolling into an existing institution is my thought, at least, was there aren't enough people in this industry to necessarily make it financially viable for the you know kind of effort to be involved. I would prefer to see this uh, tool for illustration in general, mm -hmm. because you know there's the artists uh, graphic artist market book. And it's got thousands and thousands of listing, and there are thousands and thousands of illustrators across the entire field of editorial advertising and all that who also need this. And they're yeah. getting screwed in their industries too, right? But so. it, can, it can start here. It can know? start small. Yeah, but, uprisings yeah. start yeah. in the ghetto, don't they? Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> they always start in the ghetto. <laughs> you know, quite frankly, none of the existing organizations have ever done anything to help me in my career. So I really don't want to be associated with an existing organization. I want it to be something new. There's a lot of people, young people coming out of school and a lot of us who have been here for a while and I think we need something fresh. Yeah, it keeps the intention simple and clear whereas, you know, if we were to try to join up with ASFA or something, I'd be like it. No, I'm thinking of graphic artist skills. Graphic artist skills? Um, I could see I could see talking to them I at least for input and things. Them, yeah, yeah. Sure. Society of Illustrators or any other organization at least getting input and feedback. I know. Yeah. Because there's no. Profited greatly from being associated with the graphic card skills since the early '70s, the very beginning of my career. Okay. Helped me enormously. Okay. Because uh, there's no other place to go to for reliable information about rates. Yes. Right. You know, and I heard wildly um, inaccurate. Uh, 
reportings, you know, rumors of what Frazetta was getting or this person. But I just want to know what the median standard was. And, mm -hmm. and they do get that by polling all the members and averaging out, you know. And they acknowledge in their in their handbook that it's the illustration is based on a star system and there are going to be exceptions, you know, at the high end or whatever. But, you know, and, and they also establish industry standards regarding work for hire things. And they, they fold in uh, sample contracts that you should be using. You can just... Um, download them, add your own uh, logo on the top, and, and use those boilerplate forms as your guide. And, and so that did a lot to help professionalize, I think, a lot of people in my generation anyway, when we got involved, whether it, it would be uh, uh, appropriate for this, what you have in mind. It, it could involved. be in this sense. It, in that, that it could be in that, you know, in, in our industry, sometimes we look at the graphic artist uh, guide pricing yeah. And then we just ratcheted it down like, you know, 40, 50 percent to be oh, realistic okay. in this field. But it could yeah. be useful as, as a standard by which we're giving the rating. Yeah. You know, how it's well are they actually, mm -hmm. you know, hitting those rates? Yeah. Because here they don't. Bill, did you have a comment? Yeah, I'm, I'm not an artist in any way, um, but I do have a business background. And I would just point out that if you list the names of all the illustrators who are part of your um, group, and then you you uh, publish a rating that's negative on XYZ Corporation, if they're a small company and they see all the people that are on the list, they may say, well, these three people are the only three people yeah. that you've ever dealt with. Yeah. Yeah. You could open those people up to, to retaliation. Law lawsuit. Yeah. So I'd, I would just, I agree. I would just suggest point. that you be cautious. I would, I, would, I would prefer a purely anonymous system, personally, yeah, for that, for that reason. You've had a question for a while. I, I was, not so much a question, I just see a lot of potential for a positive transformative effect because so many people are new to the industry don't know what to get into yes. with this company or that company yes. until you're already emotionally committed to it mm. and it seems the standard. And there are a lot of companies that do seem to kind of um, feed off the new crop that exactly. comes in. And if there's this rating system, then the up and coming artists can be aiming at the better companies and leaving the worst ones dry. Or to reform, or which to is reform. fine with us too. Yeah. Yeah. Right? We're dealing with negotiation because, like, so very few point. people, like, I mean, like, I'm graduating this year and I'm dealing, learning how to deal or negotiate with a company is something I'm still very new to. Well, for a lot of our industry, there's very little ability negotiate it's take it or leave it because like we've mentioned there's so many other people like you step out of line there's there's a line <laughs> <laughs> the line is still there mm -hmm. so that the idea is if everyone stepped back like Jim was able to do 10 years ago that's the only time a company can actually then they if they have no one willing to work for them they have to change but if you don't know that you have that power, or if you don't know that anyone else is willing to stand with you, then you can't, it, it doesn't. And I don't anything. even think that example I gave would even work now because mm -hmm. I only have contact with American artists, really. And if we all said no, companies could just be like, well, go to Russia. I know all these Eastern European guys, Chinese guys, all these guys, so that would get filled. Hey, there's two of them here this weekend. We could take them out now. <laughs> <laughs> This guy. Yeah. Uh, so, I, oh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Can I just make an observation? It's sure. Okay, you, I was in the industry for a little while and then worked in the game industry and then got out. Um, what I see as, as part of the problem with you're talking about people being willing to step in line and just fill in that spot. And I don't mean to offend anybody here, so please take the, don't take this the wrong way. But when Michael and all the guys that I looked up to starting out, back in the 70s, people, and, and the publishers did this, they, they went after people with a distinct style and a uniqueness to it. There seems to be, in, in my observation, um, a lot of cookie cutter sort of uh, style going on so that the X publisher has everybody painting exactly the same way, even if their portfolio, what, if you look at their stuff before they go work for this publisher, it's different. And now all of a sudden you see their work, and you don't even know it's their work until you see the name, mm -hmm. because there's a pressure for for this sort of cookie cutter thing. And the people who buy into that, you are replaceable. Then, yes, if, right. you, if you step into that style, 
And that style is so strong that it makes you change what you do. Because there's good, you know what I mean? There's, but you can all be different. I mean, when I was growing up, I could tell a whaling from a Boris, from a Kelly Freeze, from a, you know what I mean? You think yeah, back yeah. when those guys working, starting out then, everybody had a unique style. And I see this homogenous thing happening where, okay, now it's like, okay, this is a X, publisher X's style and this is publisher Y's style. But there's no difference within that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what you're seeing there is back then, in Michael's time, early on, there were only so many book covers a year. Now you have all these card games and every set needs 150 cards. So there's They're all people... Yeah. You're basically just filling a slot, filling a slot, filling a slot. And if you don't meet their style, you're not going to work. The work is for franchises. So the, the art is done for a card game, but owned outright, and then used on packaging, on posters at conventions. Right, and they've da -da 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 -da. probably given you a style guide, which is exactly how that... that that's, that's more of an issue of branding, right? Because yeah. you have it's products point, that I mean, are commissioning a lot of art under one brand, so the brand needs to be visually unified, whereas before, each... Each, each commission was granular, right? One book cover needed to be different from the next so it could differentiate itself on the, on the bookshelves. And so now, so many products now are being done under a, a branded form so that they want an identifiable style within their brand, but they want their brand to be different than the other brand. And that's the only difference. It might not even be as different as you'd like it to be. And, and but, I think if, if you go yeah. into the main show, you're not mistaking anybody's work for anybody else's no, and, work. And, and, and I think those people have established themselves, and that's why they can continue to work in the industry because they've sort of got up above the clouds. Yeah, but we're, you know, me and Randy are in the main show, and we're still fighting this fight of this crappy pay. Yeah. But Before we, we even get to look. that. Like, but, I know but, Randy's work as soon as I see it, and people know my work. As soon but as that kind of leads us to the Facebook question. Yeah, let, let, and, let and Kickstarter. First let's, thing let's about Facebook that. is, yeah, the Kickstarter, we don't know when it will be ready, but one thing we will do immediately is set up a Facebook page where uh, each of us on our websites, when it's ready, will say, hey, this Facebook right. page for the Kickstarter is ready. Go like it, then you'll be ready to get messages for when yeah, it's ready. Or, or to start contributing it. more ideas you know, yeah. to the discussion yeah, on how it might work. To, to discuss ideas too. Well, were we there did, other we did have up? one more point we wanted to make about uh, the industry in general and, and things that could help out a little bit. And somebody mentioned Kickstarter, which is a valuable tool <laughs> then if you want to say no to these companies and you come up with your own property, do a Kickstarter. If you raise enough money, you don't have to take these $200 jobs and maybe you make enough for a six month period to work on your project and then it's your IP and then you can do and lots of other things with it. And then you stand out from that crowd a little bit. And, and if enough, enough artists are able to do that and sustain that model, then these companies have less of a talent pool to pull from so they're gonna have to start meeting certain needs that we have. And, and then maybe those who are successful with their Kickstarter, uh, their income is, is, their needs are being met, and it creates room for other people to move up. So there's no reason for... And uh, speaking of Kickstarter, mine's kind of flagging right now, so you people might want to get on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a point on that I was going to make. Was gonna say. IP. That was I got a Kickstarter uh, oh, yes. thing that happened with a cousin of mine. He's a sculptor, and he was trying to get a job with games workshop he's right out of school and i was like i you know he's like i want to move he's got like three kids he's like i want to move to the uk and work you know in house and i'm like i don't know how much to pay and i don't know and he, he's like well do you know any other jobs and i didn't i don't know about miniature sculpting but anyway um i said well maybe you should just work on your portfolio for a while he put up a kickstarter to do a line of miniatures and uh like the first week he had like 30 grand 60 grand um, he ended up going 125 grand. So that was going to be my my point was that you know I, I wouldn't want it to seem like, and hopefully we're all realistic enough to know that just because you can kickstart yeah. an idea doesn't mean you're going to succeed at it. Right. You know, self publishing is always hard, and more often than not, you know, you might fail and have to start a new IP and try to launch that one again. Um, but one thing that a you can earn some freedom if you can do it, and maybe you know don't reach for the moon and try to make 300000 on your Kickstarter, but if you can get 20000 and block out a few months of time to work on something, that's a win. Additionally, the more IPs that are generated, the more, in a way, there's, there's kind of a, a marketplace pressure that's put on companies because you're creating competition for them. 
actually. You're creating, you know, new things that people will be spending their money on that they won't be spending, you know, they'll buy one, one less other thing that, you know, a company is putting out. Um, so, you know, there's an army of creatives here that could be putting out things that people can be buying and enjoying, and uh, that actually just sp spreads the money out across the industry, you know, That's more so. Point, yeah. and if you were willing to work for that low, you add up, you take a, a book's worth of those cards, Hmm. How much would that have cost? And you'll find out that's a really low rate for your Kickstarter, like two grand. At some point, when you start doing the math for what you would have worked for, and then what you're going to ask for, it's so easy to meet that you can. Then you start like, why would I? You were going to you were going to do thirty pieces in a year for one hundred and fifty dollars. You know how much is that in a Kickstarter total that you needed? Instead, do that work for Just your do project for yourself. It, that's one of the mistakes I made when I first started freelancing is I didn't know anything. I didn't know who the clients were. So I just took whatever was offered to me. I did like $75 jobs because I thought that's what you're supposed to do is like work up. And then I wouldn't get paid. And then I think I, I've realized that, you know, you could spend a week not working and just like applying for work and researching for better work. And then you realize like, you know, there's a company in Japan that'll pay, you know, 10 times what this guy pays and all I got to do is connect to that guy or in video games when I would make a video game magazine cover like they'll pay 10 to 15 grand for a video game cover um, to be made by um, like an agency so my point is is the rates and the math and, and the, the finances are wildly different in different areas and if you're just focusing on like RPG art um, those same opportunities may be available artistically, you know, in completely different, unexpected places. So it, it may be worth your while for more research and, and to just spread yourself um, into unexpected areas and and try to not just take the first things opportunities that come to you because you're excited that uh, a publisher said I want you and you're like that that makes you feel excited, you know. But sometimes saying no might be the smartest thing you do. So you've heard our ideas. Does anybody have any ideas they'd like to contribute that they think would help out? Uh, I'm sure you've thought of it, but uh, I'd like to mention just uh, finding sponsors. Uh, it's yeah, that's a great idea. That's a good one. Do you have a comment? Do you have a name for something like that? I mean, you said no, we don't even have a name for it yet. That's how germinal this is. Bones idea. We're I kind of like the, the Pavlik scale. <laughs> <laughs> I like it too. <laughs> <laughs> like we, I mean, we just wanted to put this out there and see if a few people liked it. Like, we didn't even know, you know, if people are, if you're out going to be, that sucks. Do you remember there was a, uh, a shared uh, email forum called Art Dogs? Yeah. That yeah, I bowed out a long time ago because it just became, it became very <laughs> just too much was, garbage. Very slight. We all had to vote on, on who we did part. It was before, before social networking. And I remember that was helpful, but it did get out of control. Yeah. One of the rules was, you know, it wasn't low industry. It was just for our interests. Right. And these are the different ways in which we've tried to, over the years, I've, I've moderated that for years, the art dog, by the way, um, uh, to connect with each other and get this information to each other so we can help each other avoid things, help each other find opportunities even on top of that. And so, I mean, social media is, you know, Facebook's been fantastic for that, but it's not, it's not enough because, you know, on Facebook, we're far more likely to talk about our successes and our wins and share those with each other. Not very likely to talk about being screwed because we don't want any repercussions. You know, we don't want to be negative in public. I do. Um, well, <laughs> some do, yeah. Bringing in some of the companies, not necessarily in in the like part of it, but in in the like how people are so proud to be in Consumer Reports. Like, hey, we did oh. great in Consumer Reports. Do you see us? Well, I yeah. suppose we could come up like with a, a little bug for a company that gets five out of five, and they could put and it on their I website <laughs> in their submission I section. Like, uh, you know, like the listening, I can see. Like, I want to sit down and like, okay, let me tell you what process and everything that's going on. Mm. We can create a new award. Well, right, but, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I can see it being a powerful tool for 
<laughs> middle finger. <laughs> Winner of the middle I, finger. I, I see my boss. <laughs> like, why are these people getting paid? Um, well, let me ask you, Zoe, be, like, if your boss saw that your score was not that great, would it bother him? Would oh, he? God, yeah. See, well, that's but what I we need. Because there's no other way for us to get to people above you directly. But if we do this and they see it and they're like, we're at 20 percent. What the hell is that all about? Yeah, but John was saying that so gives you ammo. Within the different companies, as far as like we have a million different properties and they all have different legal and licensing things and blah blah blah. I mean, I would very much like to literally sit down and, and mm -hmm. explain, you know, the differences behind things. You're afraid the rating system is too blunt to broadly cover, you know, the the differences and nuances and in, in why your company does what they do. Yeah, I'm, I'm well, saying I think it might be a, um, it might both mitigate uh, repercussions um, and as well help the, the rating pool to to offer to like come talk to us about your, your, your ratings and your process and how things work and just be transparent with each other. Maybe we could try to find a way where there's a connection to, to some of the main so industry companies. So it's not, yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah, not yeah. Like, not just a blunt number, but some way to, you know, mm -hmm. to be a resource for companies as well, as well not just yeah. for illustrators. Yeah, I think that's what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Don't forget to come and get one of these. Yeah, we're out of time. So um, we need to wrap it up. So yeah. look at look us up on Facebook, and we don't have a name. We don't so. have one, <laughs> <laughs> one last thing: if if you do go by my table to look at my shitty old art, do it today before the nice painting leaves in the morning. <laughs> <laughs>